And in Romans chapter number one, say a little pastor thing before we start the message tonight. I, I, I know you know this, but we know it, but we need to say it even though we know it. Um, it is great to come to church, and it's great to be faithful to come to church, but coming to church is not why we come to church. And if you're just in the routine of coming to church because it's the right thing to do and to be with your friends, and you zone out as soon as the Bible starts, and you zone back in when it's time to chit-chat with friends after church, uh, it's not going to help your life. It, it's, it, it, there's, there's no spiritual advantage to coming to church. And there's a lot of lost people go to church. They're going to die and go to hell, having, having been to church a lot. So when we pray, don't just, okay, it's time to bow my head and somebody's going to say a prayer and then I'm going to think about my home or my family or my job or the government or something and, and then we'll have another prayer and we'll start talking again. Let's really, let's really try to pay attention to what's in the Bible. Let, let God work in our heart. We can become as ritualistic as Catholics. Just going through the motions and, and being seen and checking off all the boxes and, and our lives. Can, your life can fall apart sitting right in church, in a good church. Home can fall apart, marriage fall apart, testimony fall apart, and everybody's shocked. Wow, I can't believe it. They were here all the time. Well, being here is better than being in the bar, but it's just a location if we're not letting God speak to our hearts. And, uh, and so, so let's, and I say that for, for myself and, and everybody else. Also, I also forget to mention Brother David preaching tonight, uh, part of, night and through the weekend, part of a Bible conference up in uh, Brunswick, Georgia. And from what I heard, the two messages last night were just excellent, and God's really blessing in the work up there. So, Hope you pray for Brother David. I, I, not, not jealous at all. People call and I tell them I, I can't come and preach. I have a schedule too full, but I, I sure would recommend Brother David to you and hope God will open some doors for him. And, 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 he's, and he has, and, and the more he gets to preach out there, the more he'll get to preach out there because God's, God's really gifted him and, and enabled him. And so we thank the Lord for it. Amen. I tell you, every time somebody calls wanting a pastor, I, I ask him, I said, you you want to go? And he said, no, I'm, I'm doing what God wants me to do. So it's a blessing. It's a blessing because uh, he could go tomorrow and a lot of churches be glad to have him and pay him more than we're paying him. <laughs> of course, now with this new system, that might change. But... Hey, all right, let's pray. Father, uh, please bless your word to our hearts tonight. Help us, God, to have ears to hear, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name, and amen. All right, we're looking in Romans 1. Uh, we, 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 we're, we're off track. We could go back and go through all this again. Because in looking at these characteristics of reprobate minds, we absolutely could apply them to dictators, atheists, murderers, wicked, evil people out in the world, but they're not here and they're not listening. So we've chosen to try and apply these things to our lives and make sure that we don't manifest the characteristics of those who do not like to retain God in their knowledge. And that might be a, a, a bit uh, out of context, but it's certainly profitable for us. Um, I haven't dismissed God from my knowledge for a decade or for a year but I'm, I'll bet all of us spend a half hour or so every now and God's not in our thoughts and we're acting contrary to the, to the ways of God. And the evidence of that is looking at this list. Uh, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, maybe not. Wickedness, maybe. Covetousness, likely. Maliciousness, full of envy. All of us at one time or another. Murder, well, wanting to. <laughs> Debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Now, come on, you can't put all that on communists. You can't apply all that to, to you know, just wicked, dirty people in the gutter. That's everybody at some time or another. Shouldn't be, but it is. Now tonight, here's what, here's what we have next, verse 31. Without understanding. 
without understanding. When the human mind grasps the real state of things presented to it, when it receives or comprehends the ideas others express, this is understanding. Hearing is not understanding. Learning is not understanding. Observing is not understanding. This world sees and hears and, and learns, but it's evident if you, as you look at the lives they live, they don't understand. They don't understand God, they don't understand family, they don't understand gender, they don't understand righteousness, they don't understand life, death, to disaster. We have more educated people in this country than probably any nation's ever had. We have more money spent on education. We have more information available we have the, through schools and internet and lectures and, and libraries and all of that. But what a bunch of dummies walking around. And it's not for an absence of facts, it's for a, a, an inability to, to properly understand what's being presented. Let me show it to you from the Bible. Uh, come to Genesis 42. Genesis 42, we'll go way back and just look at how this thing is, this real basic simple stuff to start out with and then we'll uh, get in a little deeper as we go along, Lord willing. Uh, Genesis 42, verse 23, this is Joseph's brothers talking down there in Egypt. He's got them on the hot seat. Verse 23, and they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. Now we just use this for an example. Here's one man speaking to another man in, say, Spanish. And a man who speaks English but not Spanish hears the two people speaking, but he doesn't understand them. Man, it's not deep, but there it is. You can hear people talk and not understand what's being said. Happens in the living room all the time. Happens in the church house all the time. Happens on the job all the time. It might not be a foreign language, but the very language you speak may be foreign to you if you don't comprehend the words that are said. Now, look at 1 Samuel chapter 4. We might also fail to uh, comprehend the circumstances or the situations in which we find ourselves. In 1 Samuel 4, 6, when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come up into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. Now, when they heard the shout, they knew it was a shout, but they didn't know the cause of the shout or the importance of the shout. When they found out that the ark had returned to its proper place and rallied their opposition troops, then they understood, oh, that's what it was all about. Some of you went to church for a long time before you got saved. You saw people sing praise to the Lord and you didn't understand why they were singing like that. You saw people shout when things were said about Jesus Christ. You didn't understand why anybody would get excited about that. And so many times people observe something or overhear something or, but they don't know the details of it. They don't, they don't have a comprehension of, of what, what's that all about. Try this one, Psalm 106. Psalm 106. And look what the Bible says about a people who watched nine massive plagues fall on Egypt and then watch the Red Sea part so they could cross on dry land as that tenth plague took out the firstborn in every Egyptian home. Verse number seven, our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Now, wouldn't you think after 10 plagues fell upon your captors, and you walked out of that city without any opposition, you would have said, praise God, glory to God, we're free. But they watched all that and didn't know what God was doing. 
maybe didn't even know it was God that was doing it according to Psalm 106 verse 7. How many things has God done in our lives and he got Romans 1, he got no thanks, he got no glory, he got no praise because we lacked the understanding to equate that blessing to God's work in our life. We lack the understanding to see that wasn't luck, that wasn't chance, that wasn't my hard work, that wasn't a fortunate bounce. God! And then he gets the glory. Lord says when, when God does great things in our lives but there's no praise offered to him and there's no faith built up in our hearts, it's because we lack understanding. Try this one. Uh, Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. We read disobedient to parents on Sunday morning. Why is a child disobedient to a parent? We read about whispering and backbiting, and yet it continues. And we see lost people scoffing at an offered gospel tract. And we see uh, people with trouble in their home turning the shoulder to counsel and advice. Uh, every day you see someone presented with helpful information that doesn't want it. Correct? All right, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 29. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. You want to, look, when, when, a man, when a man at work first appreciates the lewd woman that he's working with. He lacks the understanding of where that will lead. When a young person first uh, gets talked into that can of beer or first gets talked into that, that cigarette, they lack the understanding to see where that's going to lead. When a family gets their nose out of joint and says, that's it, we're not going back to church, they never look at those children on the way home and comprehend where that's going to lead. Um, we can learn facts, we can gather information, we can hear truth, we can have advice offered to us, but so many times we, we lack the understanding of, if I set my feet on this path, where does it lead? Man, that's the world you live in. My generation was raised on live for today. Drop out, get high, shack up. Well, where's this going to leave me 30, 40 years from now? Oh, come on. That's for old people. Well, now they're old people. And they're wanting you young people to give up more and more of your paychecks to provide them with what they should have provided themselves. What lack of understanding. Doesn't it, doesn't it boggle your mind? Look, I, I get it. I get it. Saturday night outside a bar, I get somebody blowing off the gospel. I don't get a guy 85 years old in a nursing home blowing off the gospel. Do you not have any understanding, man? It's not like you got a long road ahead of you. I mean, you, you got a good chance of going to bed tonight waking up in hell. You don't understand that? And they don't. Now that man, that man might have been a successful businessman. He might have been a high-ranking military officer. He might have been a, a minister in some liberal denomination somewhere. Nobody's saying he's not smart. Nobody's saying he hasn't learned a lot of things. But he doesn't have any understanding. Or he wouldn't be telling you to leave him alone. There's a man, I, I just, he just comes to mind, uh, named the Colonel. And the Colonel, we, we led him to Lord in Ocean View Nursing Home. But it took, it took months and months and months of going to see that man during the week and witnessing to him, inviting him out to church. And he would always say, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm too busy. You're in a nursing home. You're not busy. You got nothing to do. But he'd always say, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. And, and he had on a picture of his, of his little dresser in his room, man, this military uniform and all these decorations on the uniform. And he'd been a colonel in the Italian military, Second World War. And we just kept witnessing to him, witnessing to him. And, and uh, 
One day I went in there and I said, Sir, your commanding officer, the Lord Jesus Christ, demands that you repent. And he said, I'll give that some thought. And I went back that next week. I kid you not, I'd never seen him in anything but that nursing home gown thing they make him wear. I went in there and that guy was dressed. He had his shirt all buttoned up. He was sitting up in that chair and I walked in that, in that room and he said, would you ask Jesus if he'll be available today? That guy bowed his head and asked the Lord to save him. I kid you not, we, we're having service that night on Monday night in the nursing home. That guy was going up and down the hall in his wheelchair saying, I'm going to heaven, who will go with me? I'm going to heaven, who will go with me? Come to church, come to church. God saved, man. That guy didn't live much longer after that. You know, listen, smart man, but he lacked understanding of, of his future and of where he was going. Uh, oh, listen, you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing. You need to consider your latter end. Where's that going to get you? You keep going that way. All right, now, let me zip through this. What if you could walk with Jesus? Wouldn't that be great? He's here right now. You could walk with him, listen to him, see his miracles, hear him teach. I'll give you four out of dozens. Mark 9, 32. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. Luke 2.50, and they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Luke 9.45, but they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them that they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. Luke 18.34, and they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. You, you don't have to be listening to me. You could be listening to Jesus Christ himself, God manifest in the flesh, and not know what he's talking about. How many times is he telling him he's going to the cross? And Peter's out there with a sword trying to keep it from happening? Learn, they learned, they heard, they saw, they observed, they experienced, but they didn't understand. God help us. God help us. Now, let's go to Exodus 31 and look at the first time the word is used in the Bible. Exodus chapter 31. Exodus 31. And verse number one, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. Now, look at that. The first time God uses understanding in the Bible, it's something set beside knowledge. See that? I gave him wisdom and understanding and knowledge. There's a lot of people in this world have knowledge, but they don't have understanding. There's a lot of people in this world have, have wisdom, but they don't have understanding. Without God, you don't have the wherewithal to make sense of what you know. You don't have the ability to properly use and process the information. Make sense? Let's see it in the Bible. Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and Deuteronomy 32 show you a people with God as Romans 1 recommends and a people without God as Romans 1 recommends warns against. Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 32. All right, Deuteronomy 4, verse 6. Keep therefore and do them. That's the uh, verse 5, the statutes, the judgments, commandments, verse 6. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So, wh what did they have? They had statutes. They had commandments. They had judgments. But the Lord said, You won't have understanding unless you keep them and do them. The information is necessary. 
but acting upon the information is the means whereby God gives us understanding. Our young people say, and, and, and they say it, our, our adults think it, but our, our young people say, well, I don't understand why I have to do that. You won't understand why you have to do it until you do it. You can hear preaching, and you can hear a sermon, and you can read the Bible, and so I don't see where that's going to benefit me, and you won't until you do it. And they say, oh, I get it. I get it. Now, now it makes sense. Deuteronomy 32, now look at the opposite side of this thing. Deuteronomy 32 and verse number uh, 28. Or 27, were, were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all this. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. See it is, there it is again. There it is again. They, they wouldn't take counsel from God, and as a result, they were a nation of people void of understanding. Now, what's Romans 1 say? You won't hear God's word. It's right there for you to listen to. If you won't hear God's word, you push God away, you will manifest that by being without understanding. Just easy. Look, just, we'll just skim the surface. We don't have to even get in the depths of the sewer. You live in a nation that doesn't understand any correlation between massive amounts of free pornography to youth and massive amounts of sexual assaults and child molestation. You know why? They push God away. That's the simplest thing in the world to understand if you've got a brain. But they have brains and don't understand it because there's no God. How do you live in a nation where adults bring children into the world and aren't sure what gender their children are? I mean, you would, if somebody would have told you 15 years ago that would even be a point of discussion, you would have said, nobody's that stupid. Nobody is that stupid. It's not a lack of intelligence. These are college-educated people promoting this. They've just push, pushed God so far away, they don't even understand what bathrooms to use. That's how messed up they are. You live in a society that doesn't understand the most simple, basic, rudimentary facts of life. Because 12 years of free public school education, not lack of knowledge, Instant access to all facts known to man at the push of a button on your computer. Not a lack of knowledge. College degree is available. If you can't afford it, we'll give you a loan. If you can't pay back the loan, we'll just write it off. If you vote right. Uh, it's not a lack of facts. It's not a lack of information. It's a lack of God. You live in a nation that is, that is increasingly literate, increasingly quote-unquote educated, but clueless. And, and they manifest it in ways that just make sane people shake their heads. Every single day. All right, let's try it in the New Testament. Come to Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 4. All right, Ephesians 1.16, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, now think about this. Verse 15, let's go back there. Wherefore I also, after heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. Isn't that good? 
and your love to the saints. Isn't that good? All right, so every saved person at Ephesus was saved, right? Every saved person in the land is saved, right? You know how many saved people in Ephesus and how many saved people in the land give no thought whatsoever to God's great power that could work in their life to deliver them from vices and habits and sins and shortcomings? Yeah. Now, if you ask them, no, no, let, let's try one. Everybody in a Bible-believing church knows what the Bible teaches about alcoholic beverages. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Knowing that doesn't keep 95% of the ministers and church members of America from saying, well, Jesus sent water into wine, so why can't I drink, you, you idiot? Yeah. You know a verse. I bet you know the other verses. I bet you know all the Bible illustrations that prove your misuse of the verse you're claiming to know. You know what you don't understand? The working of God's power in your life so that you would live in such a way that you don't have the slightest desire for something that might be questionable. Christians sitting around arguing about whether or not they can drink because it's legal, or I know a Christian that does it, or I've done it for a long time and it hasn't hurt me. You have no understanding of the power of God that would make you not even want to do something like that? You know what he's praying? He's not praying that these Ephesians would know more Come on, look at it. Look at verse number 17. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You have this knowledge about Jesus, but when was the spirit of the thing revealed to you? So you can quote verses about God is love and we ought to love one another and greater love hath no man than this, but who do you love? Where's the spirit behind the information? Well, you know, the whole world's going to hell. I know that. Boy, anybody doesn't know Jesus, they're going to hell. Good facts. Have you told anybody how to be saved this week? Then the spirit that's to accompany the knowledge is absent. Amen. What's he asking for? Verse number 18 the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Do you have an inheritance? Oh yes, oh yes, I'm saved and, and I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ and, and, and everything that God's going to give him, he's going to give it. Good, you've got the right facts. You passed the quiz in Bible school. Why are we coveting all the things of the world and living our life round the clock for material things when we know we're a joint heir with Christ? Because we lack the understanding that empowers the information. Come on, does that make sense? There's not a Christian headed for a divorce court tonight who doesn't know all the verses on divorce. You know what they lack? They lack the power of God to put the spirit of those facts to work in their life. You know what he's praying? He's not praying they'll know more. He's praying they'll understand what they know. So that God's word is not like Mongolian to a person who's never heard the language spoken. I know somebody's talking, but I don't know what they're saying. I can recite back to you what God said, but I don't know what he's talking about. Now look at, look at the other side. So he's praying for, for the eyes of their understanding being enlightened. Look at Ephesians 4.18. Here's lost people. Verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. 
who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. See what he said? You know as a Christian the way lost people live, the way you used to live is not how you're supposed to live. They know that. He's asking them to not walk like people who don't know it. You understand, the fastest growing churches in this and every town in America are people who are, are, are going to church and being told all that matters is knowledge. You don't have to live it. They make fun of us for asking Christians to apply principles of righteousness in the Bible to their daily lives. They apply a standard of living to your relationship with Christ they wouldn't apply to any other relationship in their life. God doesn't care what you do as long as you praise Him. Try that in your marriage. My wife doesn't care how, how contrary to marriage I live as long as I tell, I love you, 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 I love you. Doesn't count. You don't feed your kids, you don't provide for your kids, you don't work and put food on the table for your kids, and you tell them you love them. Who cares? So you come to church and you chant for 20 minutes and tell God how much you love Him. And then you go out and live like other Gentiles. Who cares? It's a testimony that we lack understanding. If we're saved and still living like lost people, it just shows we know things about the Bible and know things about God, but we don't have any real comprehension of them. So he's praying in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 4, that we'd, we'd get that comprehension. Now, come to 1 Kings 3. Let's go there. Oh, the night is young. We've got lots of verses to talk about here. 1 Kings 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. This is the Lord. He comes to Solomon by night in a dream, and he says, uh, whatever you want, whatever you want, just name it. And the Bible says... Verse number 7, And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people. Well, what do you mean? That I may discern between good and bad. How about that? For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? Verse 11, God said to him, Because thou hast asked this thing. End of the verse. But hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart. Now, it wouldn't hurt you, young man, young lady. It wouldn't hurt you every day of your life. When you woke up before you put your feet on the floor to say, God, I'm but a child. I, I do not know what's facing me today. Give me the understanding to know what's good and what's evil. It wouldn't hurt every adult sitting here to every single morning say, God, I'm a child. I'm a child. Give me an understanding heart. I may know what's good and what's evil. So I don't need to pray that. Do you have any idea what, what saved people say to a Bible preacher in a good church consistently? Well, I don't see why you preach against that. I don't see what's wrong with that. I don't see why that's all so bad. Did you ever ask God to give you a clue? Don't brag that you don't see anything wrong with something a preacher just showed you for 45 minutes from the Bible is wrong. That's like a six-year-old saying, I don't see what's wrong with it, Mom. Well, you're a six-year-old. Of course you don't. But if you're a 45-year-old Christian and you just read eight verses in the Bible about something, you ought to see it. And Solomon said, you know what? The life that is set in front of me is more than I can handle on facts. 
It's more than I can hit. Look, he had power. He had an army. He had a, had a billion dollars and more. He had anything a man could want at his disposal. He said, God, what I don't have is knowing what to do with it. What I don't have is knowing how to react to it. What I don't have is knowing how to interact with those people. I, I am so thankful I'm in a church full of people that reads the Bible. I hope you read the Bible. And that listens to the Bible preached. I, I know you listen to the Bible preached. And that, and that learns things about the Bible. I know you do. But are we asking God to give us an understanding of what we're learning so that we're living properly? Facts won't do it. You know, as a general rule, everybody that spends four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve, fifteen years in a church like this and then quits, leaves with all the knowledge they acquired while they were here. Then why do they end up where they are a year later? They've still got the knowledge, but without a God-given understanding to know what to do with it, you can ruin your life just like somebody who's never been here. God help us. Stop thinking that stuff and facts in our brain is the same as having the Holy Ghost control in our heart. It's not the same. All right, Job 17. Job 17. Romans 1 said, if you don't like to retain God in your knowledge, God will give you over to reprobate mind. Is that, is that not correct? All right, look at Job 17. Oldest piece of literature on the face of the earth. Job 17, verse 4. For thou hast hid their heart from understanding. You push the Bible away, you push God away, guess what he'll do? He'll take understanding with him when he goes. Job 28, Job 28. I'll get a guru, I'll get a priest, I'll meditate, I'll do yoga, I'll try some TM, I'll go to college and get a degree. Job 28, 20. Whence then cometh wisdom, and where is the place of understanding seeth it is hid from the eyes of all living. That's what God said. He didn't say, I'll have knowledge from you. There's a tree that your forefathers ate that gave you access to the knowledge of good and evil. God didn't say he'd hide knowledge from you. He said he would hide understanding. He would let you be president of the United States, a Supreme Court justice, or a seminary professor, and not have a clue. That's something to think about, isn't it? Some of the smartest people in this world that run, run the finances of nations are broke. Don't you think that's an odd thing? People that know how to make millions and millions and millions of dollars end up bankrupt. Don't you find that curious? People write books about relationships and they're on their fourth marriage. <laughs> kind of odd, isn't it? You can have the facts, but if God doesn't show you and teach you and help you do something with them, and you're not going to find it outside God. That's what he said. Here's the facts. Well, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> you want me? No. Okay. Then I'll ju he just takes the understanding and hides it. These guys down there on the campus, you ought, to go, you ought to go one month with Brother Ed and the crew down to UCF. And watch people brag about being so well educated that they believe they can't know anything. Who would brag about that? If I just spent four years and a small fortune to get a diploma, and I proudly held it aloft and said, I know nothing! <laughs> you know what a dope you have to be to tell anybody that? That's your bragging rights? I can't know anything for sure? I don't want to be anywhere near an intersection when you approach a traffic light. 
it's red, well, you can't know that for sure. They don't apply that to anything in their life. Just when Jesus shows up, all of a sudden they can't know anything. Well, I got to go to class. How do you know? My class starts in 15 minutes. How do you know? Well, the, you know, the class is at nine, it's quarter to nine. How do you know? You ju they're just liars. They know everything, but when Jesus shows up, you can't know anything. You know what they've done? They just push God away and push God away and push God away, and they got all this knowledge and no understanding. Job 28, 28, right here, same place. Now, here's, here's a way to, to get back in on this thing. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. As long as you're in a church or a Bible study or a circle of friends, real or online imaginary friends, who are telling you that your God and your Jesus and your Christianity doesn't require that you stop sinning, you will never have any understanding of what you're learning about God in the Bible. When you, when you are willing to depart from evil, God will stop hiding understanding from you. And you will stop making excuses for the things that are obviously destroying your life. This world's so crazy. They're so crazy. Thank the Lord for the bus ministry. Because if you'd see the homes these, these kids come from, well, they're not homes. If you'd see the roof over the head these kids come from, and you would think after three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine generations of depravity and disease and drug addicted death, somebody would say, why am I living like this? Why don't I get on that bus and go to church? But until you're ready to depart from evil, you can't even see the folly of generation after generation of self-destruction. You, you know why you can walk up to those situations and say, why is that woman with these men? Why is, that, why is that man with these women? Why are they involved in all these drugs and all this addiction and all this abuse and all this molestation and all this disease? Why don't they get out of that? And you ask them, what? What? Not a clue. Not a clue. You know why? Push God away, push the Bible away, push Jesus away, replace it with rap and TV and meth and pot and booze and fornication and then wonder why you can't see the way out of the most miserable life anybody's ever lived since your mom and your grandmother and your great-grandmother. You know, I was a kid, I, I, I read a lot, read, read all kinds of books. I like to read, I, I never read a lot of fiction. I always like to read true stuff. And I remember reading these books about the Eskimos. And it's, you know, 190 degrees below zero, whatever it is, and the ocean's frozen over, and they're eating whale blubber all winter long. And I thought, did nobody ever say, let's walk south and see what's there? <laughs> but I'm thinking that as a kid, it's like, is there a fence around it or something? You can't get out? Why don't they move? And now they got the internet. They know there's trees and stuff somewhere. <laughs> don't, you, don't you ever go minister in these housing projects and places and say, don't they know there's something else? Don't they know you don't have to live like this? Yes, it's not a lack of knowledge, it's a lack of understanding. Well, those cruel, evil, rich people put me here, leave. The fence around it is, <laughs> there's a gate. It's not law, you can leave. 
Well, I don't know where I'd go. I don't know what I'd do. Well, go to church and get saved and let somebody who's not living like this to you. They came to your door. They offered you a ride. They got a Bible. They offered to tell you how they got out of what you're in. Well, is that that church that makes you... See? They'd rather live in filth than depart from evil. And so you can't impart understanding. Pretty sad. Pretty sad. All right, let's look at, we got to get moving here. Uh, Job 32, while we're here in the neighborhood. Job 32. Job 32. Verse number 8. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. You know anything that you have that came by inspiration of the Almighty? All, come on, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. You want understanding? It's here, it's available. Uh, Job 38, verse 36. Job 38, verse 36. Who hath put wisdom in the inward parts, or who hath given understanding to the heart? So what would it be? It'd be a gift from God, wouldn't it? Psalm 119. Psalm 119. So the inspiration of the Almighty, a gift from God. We're talking about how you get uh, de uh, and departing from evil. We're talking about how you get understanding. Now watch it here. Psalm 119, verse 101. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Feet, right here, path, where you need to go. You want understanding? Obey the scriptures. You got to have them, we do. You've got to read them, we do. You've got to learn them, we do. You've got to obey them, do we? We can come Sunday morning and, and have a lesson. Four days ago. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we can go home and spend another week not bringing up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We can have a lesson. Husbands, love your wives. And spend another week not laying down our life for our spouse. Wives, be in, you know. And we can spend another week arguing that God isn't as smart as I am. Well, it's not a lack of knowledge. We have enough knowledge around here to coast on till the rapture. But it's not going to benefit us if we don't put it into practice in our lives. We will be void of understanding. If we want to obey the Word of God and want to walk in God's ways, then we'll not only have the knowledge, we'll have the understanding that's necessary to make it work. My, my wife, she, uh, her dad was a contractor. If she had her way, uh, she would be working for J. Hill building houses. And she, she sells these little dogs and she takes her money and she goes and buys these. We got all these power tools and tool kits and tool sets and everything else. Now, all that is thine is mine, and all that's mine is thine. So, I am the owner of a large quantity of power tools. I know that, and I know what they do. I don't have the slightest idea how to use them. She does, and I tell her, put your goggles on, don't cut your fingers off. That's all I ask, just build what you want, tear it down, rebuild it, all that, and she has, she has a great time. She has a great time. Praise the Lord. I have the stuff. I don't know what to do with it. Okay, I lack understanding. Guys, some of you want a wife. 
when you get one if all you know how to do is quote scripture at her you're gonna have something and you won't know what to do with it getting a wife is not beneficial well, boy if I could just get married that'd be the answer to all my problems no it wouldn't not if you don't know what you're doing Well, you know, if I just get out from under mom and dad's roof and get my own apartment and so you can do what? Start drinking beer, start listening to rock music, start watching dirty movies? What you need is not your own place if you don't know what to do with it. You understand what we're saying? You can sit in a church like this and rot your life. You can graduate Bible school and rapidly rot your life. If it's just facts, and God knows we're not downplaying the facts. We're, you know, we're a beacon of facts. <laughs> but you got to let God show you how to put it into practice in your life. All right, let's go to, we'll head down the home stretch here. Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8 and Psalm 73. Psalm 73, Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah 8. Psalm 73. Nehemiah chapter 8. These are the children of Israel. They've had the law for over a thousand years. They've spent most of that time in bondage or captivity. You ever think about that? Praise God, we've got the scriptures and no other nations have the scriptures. Yeah, but you, you've spent half of your history in slavery because of your disobedience to God. So it didn't really advantage them to have the scriptures if they didn't practice them. Correct? Now they come back from 70 years of captivity in Babylon, and watch this. Uh, they, they build this pulpit, and Ezra and Nehemiah, they stand up before the people. Uh, verse 4, Ezra the scribe stood upon the pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood, and they list all the names of the men that stand up there. Verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. A lot of churches do that. They stand up and the preacher reads the scripture. You'd be up and down more times than a Catholic in our church. Anyway. <laughs> verse number 8. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. See that? That's what every man that stands in this pulpit is supposed to do. Read the Bible, explain the Bible, and then make the application of the Bible so the people know what to do with what they've learned. Amen. Now, that's as far as the minister can go. Watch, look at verse 12. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. How about that? They've been eating for a thousand years. They've been drinking for a thousand years. But now they're eating and drinking with mirth. What made their routine lives full of joy and rejoicing? They finally understood what God wrote in the Bible. Amen. They'd had the information for a thousand years. But when they stopped and listened to it and took it to heart and applied it to their lives, instantly their lives became full of joy instead of lives of bondage and captivity. I don't know if it's anybody here in our congregation, but, uh, but I know, I know in any church this size, there's liable to be people with tons of information and knowledge about the Bible enough to win many an argument 
and you're in bondage to a habit or in bondage to a bitter spirit or in bondage to, to some uh, sin, and you're coming to church but you're not happy, and you're married to a saved person but you're not happy, and you got a steady job but you're not happy, don't you get it? It's good to be here and it's good to learn and you need to learn, but if you don't do anything with it, your life's just like a Babylonian life. The mirth, the joy, the gladness, the happiness in the routine things came from understanding the scriptures. Come on, that, look at it, look at that verse. It's, it's an impressive verse. They ate, they drank with mirth. How is it at your supper table? Good. Are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. You believe the Bible? King James only. Good. Rapture, pre-trib, post pre-trib. Good, very good, very good. Amillennial, post-millennial. Oh God, you're not gonna trick me on that. Pre-millennial, okay. How is it when you and the family sit down to dinner? What, isn't it good to have all that information? But the, the lost people next door are smooching and laughing and enjoying supper together. And here's two saved people can't hardly speak to each other. You understand? There's got to be more to this thing than knowledge. Psalm 73. Psalm 73. Did you see on the news? Yeah, that'll get you down. Did you read in the paper? That'll get you down. You know what's going on? That'll get you down. Sure will. World's a bad place, man. Has been for a while. All right, take a look. First number uh, 12. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Now, see, you read that, you think Hillary or Trump or, you know, depending on what side you're on. You wouldn't think that if you lived in China or Tibet or Philippines. You'd think about whoever, whoever's bugging you, right? And he, and he says in verse number um, 14, for all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. Now, you know, 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. You know what the, the antidote is for your worldwide blues? It's not a more conservative website. It's not a better slant from the news media. It's not more information about what the ungodly are doing in the world. It's getting in a place like this and remembering that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is coming back on a white horse to kick that bunch out and take over. Amen. You can be saved and as worried and nervous and upset. You know how many economic collapses I've lived through in 40 years being saved? Do you know how many ends of the dollar I've lived through? Do you know how many total concentration camp captivities in America I've lived through? Every president since I was saved has been the Antichrist. Every, every new legislation is, but this is it. Your money's not going to be any good anymore. We're all going to have to take the mark. Blah, 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 blah. Go to church, read the Bible, get your eyes on Jesus Christ, and you'll understand the only body knows what's going to happen tomorrow is the Lord. And he said, we win. Hallelujah. We might lose every battle, but we win. All right, Psalm 49. Psalm 49. You know what Romans 1 said? The invisible things of him, the creation of the world, are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Right? So you start with understanding. In your heart, there's a God. You push God away, what do you replace him with? Man, 
four-footed beasts, birds, creeping things. Yesterday, I turned on my computer, and up comes the home page, Bible Baptist Church. Every day I want to look and see who's the, who the pastor is, because things, things can change. And so, so that comes up. And at the bottom, this thing came across and it said, today is National Tree Day. Have you hugged a tree today? <laughs> now, it's not, it's not that one person would be stupid enough to suggest that. It's that a whole nation would think, yeah, that's really neat. How far gone do you have to be to think it's rational to hug a tree? R really, just if you just give that a minute's thought, it's beyond stupid. Ants, bugs, sap, no reciprocal love at all. The tree does put its arm around you and hug you back, it just means you took two of your meds instead of one. <laughs> This country is so messed up. We're, you know, we're in church. We're weird. But hugging a tree, that's perfectly normal behavior. That might have got you committed a generation ago. Uh, yeah, I, I'm calling all the brothers and sisters. Yeah, dad's in the backyard hugging a tree. Oh no, we better get him to the doctor. Today, dad's in the backyard and we're all joining dad hugging a tree. <laughs> this country's just off its, out of its mind, man. The only good news I read this week is that uh, they think now that cell phones and computers are causing a large number of males in their 20s and 30s to be unable to produce children. Thank God. <laughs> that's, that's the best news I've heard in, in years. <laughs> Spend more time on the computer. <laughs> so, do we need to edit that? Is that over the line somewhere? I, Psalm 49, verse number 20. Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. You know what that is? It's Romans 1. The cow never thanks God. The horse never thanks God. The dog, the cat, the pig never thank God. Your nation gets its diploma and never thanks God. It gets its job and never thanks God. It gets its promotion and never thanks God. It gets its retirement papers and never thanks God. It gets its... Because they lack understanding, they just live like animals. May the Lord help us. While we're getting all this knowledge that, thank God, is so abundant for us here in this church... Let's don't live like the beasts of the field. Let's don't walk like other Gentiles. Let's let God separate us from evil. Give us the spirit of the knowledge so that we know what to do with it. Not just have the facts, but live the Christian life. Amen? Amen. All right, Father.